this week on Millennial. I'm serious. I've brought this up with my therapist before and she's like, yeah, she's like, you just need to like learn how to take up space and like say thank you and move on. And that's perfectly okay. Do we have the same therapist, Pam? Or I will tell somebody, text me when you get home if I don't necessarily trust that they can make it home by themselves. You tell me to text you when I get home all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Tr- I worry about you, Pam. So here's the other thing to uh, pay attention to with regards to this new change is that it's only going to impact showtimes after 4 p.m. And as is well documented on this show, I like to go with the other grandparents. Early bird smart. <laughs> so Pam's so it's okay. it's not going to impact me at all. Welcome to Millennial, the home of pretend adulting and real talk. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. And I'm Pamela. Welcome back, Laura. We missed you last week. I missed y'all. You and I apparently received a memo to wear red for Valentine's Day. I know. Oh my gosh. And uh, my wonderful boyfriend, Mark, is here serving me wine right now. Wow. What service? <laughs> what we're leaving out here is that we're having wine in After Dark. And I was like, can you please bring me a glass of wine? Because I forgot to bring one. And he showed up right in the nick of time. Like, Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Laura told us before the show that wine was reserved. Oh, wait. Are we going to get a kiss? <laughs> He's a tip. Oh, he wants money. Oh, he wants money. Oh, he wants money. it looks That's like Laura was like about to pucker her lips. I was expecting a kiss on the no. show, and then no, no, no. and then he just asked for money. That's that's love. That's love, right? That's a relationship that's been going on for six years or so. Yeah, that's how you know. <laughs> give me a kiss. No, give me money. <laughs> <laughs> and that bottle of wine you told us right before we started recording was supposed to be for after the show tonight, right? Because it's Valentine's yeah. Day. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Um, we, you know, we don't usually do a ton for Valentine's Day, but we'll get like a nice bottle of wine and have something nice for dinner. And he came home from the store earlier today and was like, look at this wine I got us. And I was reminded in the pre-show that we're drinking wine in After Dark. And I was like, oh, shit, I forgot to bring a glass. So I texted him. I was like, can I have a glass of that wine that you got for us? <laughs> Time to open the bottle of wine for us. And I will drink it by myself with Andrew and Pam. <laughs> well, then I'm not drinking it by myself. <laughs> yes, fair enough. But it was intended for you two. So it's it's funny. <laughs> yeah, we appreciate I mean, him sharing with us. Yeah, That's really yes, nice. <laughs> thank you. It's a little it's a little baby glass. It's not. A ton. Millennial owes you to a bottle of wine. What did you get? What, barefoot? What what brand of wine? <laughs> barefoot. No, barefoot? Am I in college? <laughs> no, I actually, I'm not familiar with the brand. I'll have to slack it to you later. Yeah, please. Well, so yeah, we all got wine today and we'll um, start sipping it in After Dark because it's kind of a Valentine's Day themed After Dark. But anyway... Laura, you actually kind of got a Valentine via Apple Podcasts. A couple weeks ago, I read a review on air that said, I love listening to Andrew and Pam, and we were upset that Laura was left out. But look at this. We got a five-star review from WWCJD1, who said, love listening to Laura. Oh, my gosh. That's wow, the perfect what? response to that last review. <laughs> I know. That's beautiful. You know what? Thank you so much, WWCJD1. Um, I love you, too. Aww. <laughs> I wonder what the username means, WWCJD. Yeah. So it's not what, what would Jesus would do? Charlie. CJ do? What fictional ca- CJ? I'm hmm. thinking of CJ from the West Wing. Oh, well, that checks oh, out because you're yeah, a big West Wing fan. Right. So, But then what's the one? Well, WWCJD was probably taken, maybe, so they added a one, and maybe they think CJ is number one. She is, honestly. There you go. All right. Well, anyway, wanted to talk about this piece from New York Magazine's The Cut. They influenced the internet late last year with their Nepo Baby piece, and we didn't talk about it on air. But now they're back with another piece getting people talking again about popular culture and just the way to live, they shared 140 etiquette rules for specific kinds of interactions or situations that make people anxious, afraid, uncertain, ashamed. And we went through these rules, and the three of us are going to now agree or disagree with three each. And they put a lot of thought into this next piece, and I love some of these. 
So this first one, and I'm quoting now, while on a date, if you find you're talking a lot, ask yourself, when was the last time I asked a question? There's no need to keep a tally or trade queries back and forth like it's a tennis match, but do at least be aware of how long you're holding the floor and take care to share it, end quote. I want to extend this out to being amongst friends, too. Shut the fuck up <laughs> if you are talking for several minutes and let the other person talk for a few minutes. It is very clear to me, at least, when somebody is talking for way too long a time and needs to shut the hell up and share the floor. This actually happened to me a few weeks ago. A friend was over, and let's hope they don't listen to the podcast, and... They would not stop talking. I was ready to walk out of my own home. I was getting so annoyed with how this person was oh, talking. Man. You're going to have to text us after the show and let us know who it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. Um, no, I, I think we've all been in that situation. And usually what makes it even more awkward is if you're in a big group and that person is there because you will slowly start to see everyone start disassociating. And just phasing out of the conversation um, and everyone's eyes are glassed over and that person just keeps on going. Like, I think it's a social awareness thing or can be. Yeah. But yeah, it can be really irritating. Maybe there's like social anxiety, too, where it's just like they're so stressed about there not being any silence. Yeah, maybe. I think so, too. It's also really exceptionally worse when the person is an interrupter. I think we all know somebody like that. It's like they always interrupt and it doesn't matter if they say sorry to me. I know people that are, they will interrupt because maybe they have a short attention span. But I I notice, especially when they say, sorry, but you were saying about this and, and they get extra points from me if they remember what I was saying before they interrupted <laughs> me. Because then it's like, oh, you were actually listening. You weren't just like waiting to command yeah floor. it got to the point with this person a few weeks ago where i just would start bluntly cutting them off to try and speak so i could enjoy talking myself for a little bit <laughs> but yeah i mean you definitely see this on dates too and i oh, i think yeah. it comes back to self-awareness just to be a good person in the world and society amongst friends on a date you gotta be self-aware for 90% of it, we're all going to make mistakes with what we say or maybe talking a little too much. But you just got to keep that voice on in the back of your head who's saying, all right, now it's time to ask them about where they came from or what they've been doing or how their holidays were or what's going on with their work. Like, I hate when somebody's just talking nonstop about their job. Ask me about mine. I'll talk to you about it for a little bit. It's also really easy just to say, but what about you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So it, even if you are you? not, What's if you feel like, you? yeah, even if you have trouble coming up with questions, most people that are letting you speak are probably asking you really good open ended questions. So as long as it's not something hyper specific to you, it's really easy to get into the habit of saying, but what about you? Yeah. And I've brought this up before. This is one of my top pieces of advice, mainly for dates, but it can be friends as well. Play into their interests. If they love trains, even if you don't give a flying fuck about trains, you talk to them about trains. What's your favorite train? When was the last time you were on a train? What's your favorite train in Thomas the Tank Engine, the television series? Like, ask them all kinds of questions about trains. That's how you win in life. You focus on them, and then they'll focus on you. They'll return the favor. It's a beautiful cycle. When was the last time you played Ticket to Ride, Andrew? <laughs> oh, actually, just a few weeks ago. <laughs> the reason I bring up the train example is because my interpersonal communication teacher who taught me about that was a huge fan of trains. So he would always use the train example. So next one in this list that I wanted to talk about, quote, never answer a compliment with a compliment. A couple of months ago, I met a famous singer backstage after her concert. I was wearing a loud pair of pants, the kind that attract a lot of attention wherever they go, designed by a friend. I like your pants, the singer said. I like your glasses, I responded in a panic. Horrible, false sounding. And how could it not be? A compliment that follows a compliment, even if it was meant sincerely, will always sound forced. I'm guilty of this one, responding to a compliment with a compliment. The one time where I really, I always do it, like just 
immediately. And then in my head, I'm like, oh, God, that's so awkward. Is when somebody compliments Brooklyn or is just like, oh, Brooklyn's so cute. And they have a dog, too. And I always go, oh, thanks. So is your dog. Even though, like, you know, most of the time the dog isn't cute. But I'm just saying it. Well. <laughs> you just have to. It, it feels like you have to, at least. Yeah, that's like a politeness maxim, right? There are certain social rules that we all abide by in conversation. Um, but I'm right there with you. I find it almost impossible to receive a compliment without returning one nearly immediately. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> you just feel rude if you don't. It's yeah. like, oh, your hair looks great. So if you don't respond with, oh, your hair looks great too, then that person's going to assume their hair looks like shit. <laughs> yeah, it's that's not like, even a... I, I was just going to say, it's not even a rude thing for me. It's just like, I I get uncomfortable. I don't know why. It's like an anxiety thing. And so if somebody says like, I like your shirt, I'll be like, I like your shirt. And I don't know. It's like a reflex because, you know, I don't I don't just know how to say thank you. It's an issue we're working on in therapy, y'all. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, real. It, like, I'm serious. I've brought this up with my therapist before. And she's like, yeah, she's like, you just need to, like, learn how to take up space and, like, say thank you and move on. And that's perfectly OK. Hey, do we have the same therapist, Pam? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> They're both getting their answers from WikiHow to this question that you're asking them. I guess the the thing that Vulture doesn't bring up, though, is what do you do in this situation? Pam just said, say thank you and move on. But that feels... she Well, she was also saying that you could like... like, And I, I think that I, I try to do this more if I can, but I don't always catch myself. I just go, oh, thank you. That's so very nice. You just made my day. And then we like move on. And I'll, I'll oh, ask them a nice. question. Oh, that's nice. You just made yeah. my day. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but like we workshopped that. She's like, what, what would make you feel comfortable? Like, let's role play here. It's like, it is really bad. But I hope that like me saying that will make someone listening to this feel better if they also struggle with it. Cause it does take work to be, you know, aware enough. No, but in a way, you are complimenting them back. You are gifting them something nice by right. saying, that just made my day. Like, oh, I just did something that made somebody's day. That's like actually that is a good point. So it is like a nice little happy medium sweet spot because it yeah. doesn't feel as, you know, maybe empty as thank you. And then that's it. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Next one I wanted to read. This is my last one. Quote, if you like them, text people within three hours of hanging out with them. If you didn't receive a text from me within three hours after our hanging out, it would signal that I did not have a good time and I am simply not interested. I understand that not all of my cohort follows this rule, but they should. It is rude not to confirm that a good time was had. I don't care if we've known each other for 15 years. I'd like verification of a successful hang. Most of my friends don't do this, so I tend to be the one to follow up. That said, a response to a confirmation of a solid hang is absolutely necessary. If I text, that was nice, I'd like to hear, I love you so much, in return within the hour. <laughs> this one sounds needy, and it sounds like something I would have written, but um, I didn't write it. But I do agree with it. I used to do this all the time. When I would hang out with people, you know, have a great party, I would usually text them, probably not within three hours, because, you know, get home late. But I'd text people the next day, like, hey, great seeing you great time. You know, something like that. And it feels good to receive something like that back. Because what do we what do we all do? After we leave a social situation, we start picking it apart. Oh my God, I can't believe I said this. I can't believe I did that. That felt so awkward to me. Nobody else is thinking about this except for us. That one like throwaway line that we said. But we harp on it. So that's why it feels good, I think, to receive a message like this. Do you two do this? No, not exactly like this. What I do anytime I'm, I get together with friends and either they come over here, I go to their place or we meet up somewhere is I tend to be the person who's like, hey, let me know when you get home because I want to know that people got home safe. So I'm also in the habit of reaching out to whoever I was hanging out with to be like, hey, made it home. It was great seeing you. That feels like a more natural in for me. I don't know why, but that's just what I do. I was going to say the same thing because I'm also that friend. I'm the text me when you get home friend, which I also have heard like it kind of gives it gives up off a similar effect because you're asking because you care and you want to make sure that that person 
got home safe. But I have also read that it's more common for women to ask other women to text them when they get home than it is for men to ask women to text them when they get home because women have to worry about safety issues, Mm. you know, when they're to and from. Right. places. So um, I think that that's really interesting. But yeah, I, I also find it really easy to tack that on as soon as the person say, says, I made it home safe. I just go, oh, thanks for letting me know. It was so fun seeing you. I had such a great time with you. Yeah. And then that's that. Yeah. I will tell somebody, text me when you get home, if I don't necessarily trust that they can make it home by themselves <laughs> all the time. <laughs> well, you tell me, you tell me to text you when I get home all the time. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Tr- I worry about you, Pam. <laughs> I know we've uncovered something here. Well, I'm thinking like my brother. I don't trust my brother. Yeah, there's a couple other people. I don't necessarily trust Pat. It's not. You know what? Maybe I should rephrase this. I don't. <laughs> it's not that I don't trust. It's that I love all these people, Pat, Pam, Ryan, so much that I can't bear the thought of them getting into danger on their way home. It's a protective thing. Yeah, but then there's some people, like the person who wouldn't stop talking at my house. I didn't tell them text me when you get home. <laughs> it's just like, actually, don't text me when you get home. <laughs> actually, don't get home safe. I'm done I've, with you. I've heard enough of you. I don't need to hear that you got home. <laughs> Man, this is really cruel of me. And on Valentine's Day. Uh... Well, love hurts. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. We're just keeping it real. <sighs> All right. Those are my three. What do you got, Laura? Okay. um, I picked three and I kind of thought of it as like something that's happened to me, something that I know that I've done and something that has happened to me in like a group setting. Um, My first one. Don't tell people they look like other people. The excerpt here says, in the vast majority of circumstances, it is unacceptable to issue a verdict on the totality of someone else's appearance. You cannot walk up to a stranger at a party and declare, wow, great waist to hip ratio, but you sure do have a noticeably large forehead. Yet (sighs) that is exactly what, you know who you look like is, except in code, I have assessed you. You are saying, and here is my inscrutable decision. So now the target of your observation gets to figure out if it was a compliment or an insult. And because beauty is subjective, there is no way for them to know what you meant and no (laughs) way for you to know how they received it. You simply cannot guess how the other feels about young Barbara Streisand. (laughs) This is something that has happened to me on a couple of occasions with other fair-skinned, dark-haired, plus-size women. So many times being either confused for them or just directly told, oh my gosh, you guys could be twins. And I'm like, aside from some really basic fucking features, that is not true. It is so obnoxious to tell somebody that they look like somebody else on the basis of those kinds of basic features like hair and skin color, um, size, height, and everything like that. You know, this is a, a really big problem I know for people of color. I have definitely heard stories of this probably happening to a greater extent for them, especially if they're interacting with someone who's very insular <laughs> and not exposed to the world. Um, but yeah, it's like a huge pet peeve of mine. I hate it when people do that. I honestly never thought about this one being a problem. But the reasons that you're describing and what this person on Vulture wrote make a lot of sense. I had never thought about it from the angle of by comparing you to say a celebrity you're actually reviewing every detail of a person never really thought about it before i will say to your it's all suck (laughs) well i will say to laura's point i think especially with um for anybody that is plus size it's always another plus size celebrity and because you know you don't look like that person it's not that you don't have the hindsight to realize that you do it's always like i barely look like this person so they're just comparing me because we are both larger humans yep and so that is why we look similar and that's not okay 
So yeah. I don't know if this happens to straight straight sized humans, but I hear this happening a lot to plus sized humans. I've got a great example for y'all. I was walking down the street one day and a complete stranger comes up to me and goes, oh, my God, you look like Kelly Clarkson. Oh, my God. I was like, I don't look like <laughs> Kelly Clarkson. <laughs> She's beautiful. I don't have a problem with that. But like, yeah. I don't look like her. You're just saying that because we are both plus sized individuals. Mm hmm. Um, I got that with Kelly Osborne too. I had somebody come up to me and tell me I looked like Kelly Osborne. I do not. <laughs> at Strangers all. just doing this to you. Yeah. As soon as you started that story, was I was walking down the street. We knew it wasn't going to end well. No, I mean like the fact that a complete stranger feels compelled to do that is also just bizarre. I think she was drunk, so oh, you know, we'll give her that. <laughs> I've always been compared to John Mulaney. People say I look like comedian John Mulaney in both voice and appearance, I think, because I've heard it from podcast listeners, too. Yeah, I think, you know, it's one thing to point out similar features. I just think it's weird to go up to somebody and like unprovoked tell them they look like somebody else, especially a stranger. Like, yeah. The only time I've ever kind of participated in that was uh, one time me and my dad were in the airport. And to this day, I'm convinced it was him. I saw somebody who looked like a carbon copy of Pedro Pascal. Oh. And we were in line for security together. And I was like, Dad, I think that's Pedro Pascal. And my dad looked at him and was like, no shit, like, that is him. And so my dad was like, hey, like, <laughs> are you Pedro Pascal? And the guy was just like, ah, no, I get that a lot, though. And so I'm actually convinced that it was him and he just didn't want to be bothered. Uh, Good on your dad for taking one for the team because I could never. No, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I as soon as he was like, well, let's say hi. I was like, no. <laughs> I, if if I were in that situation, I would have just creepily taken photos and texted people and been like, is this is this is this who I think it is? Is this who I think it is? The next one that I picked, and I don't really think that we uh, need to get super into the description for it from the article. The first one was the funniest one I saw. Um, <laughs> but this one is listening is not the time for you to silently rehearse what you want to say next. I agree with this. I have also been guilty of doing this, and it's been a habit that I've been working really hard to try and break. My intent in doing that is not to sort of like treat what I'm saying as more important, but it's literally my anxiety being like, don't sound like an idiot. Don't sound like an idiot. Like, be ready. <laughs> Have something smart to say. Don't be stupid. And then I realized very quickly that I've like missed half of what the other person said. Um, but it, it kind of doesn't matter that it's my anxiety because it kind of comes across asshole-ish. So it's something that I've really been trying to work on getting better at. Yeah, this is an interesting one. So basically, you're saying you're not paying attention when they're speaking because you're just getting ready to ask a question. But I guess naturally, something might just pop into your head and you might think about how to phrase it or something. I don't know. I agree. You should be focused, but you got to have sometimes have something else going on in the back of your head. Right No. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, like that happens to me sometimes in this show too, because I know that, you know, as you know, good host, Andrew will throw it to one of us. And so if I feel, if it's something that I feel like particularly unprepared by, for whatever reason, like I felt like I couldn't read up enough on it or I didn't have, I didn't prioritize it as, as much as I could. Sorry, I just hit my mic. Um, I, I am listening, but then I go, oh, wait, like what was that thing that I, I hear like one thing one of you said and I go, what was that thing that I read so that I can bring it up? Or like I know to bring it up if like it gets tossed over to me. And then before I know it, it's like I've missed, you know, maybe a couple sentences. And then it's like, oh, no, but like what if I rephrase what that person is saying? And that's what it really comes down to is that you sacrifice the potential for essentially repackaging someone else's words and then it, it makes you look like an idiot yeah you, know, you were trying to sound smart so yeah yeah a hundred percent 
podcasting is a unique, a unique situation because we're presenting to an audience. So it's it's more important that we prepare because people can listen back and listen again and again. Whereas if you're in the moment, if you're just on a date or in a social setting, there can be that silence in the middle of a conversation because you both are thinking of what to talk about next. You know, I actually just remembered that we we had to have a talk with a friend of ours about doing this. And when we told her that we had noticed that she was kind of like asking questions that sounded really out of pocket. She was saying that she just like wasn't comfortable in her social skills. And so she just like wasn't paying attention so she could think of other questions to ask. But once we brought it to her attention and I wish we had, I I wish I could remember how we phrased it because obviously it didn't go over poorly and we're still friends now, which is fine. She was like, Oh, I'm going to try and make a better effort about this. Like I didn't realize that it was, it was uh, coming off rude because it would be something like, um, like it, it would be her asking questions about something, a conversation that happened like three topics ago. So we would oh. have moved on to like um, dogs. And then she would say, she would like ask a question about sports, but sports was three conversations ago. Yeah. And it was just that she had difficulty in group settings. And so then after we understood that, it was like, okay, like, let's see, we can help you out a little bit to get a little bit more comfortable here. But it was, it was good that you know, that conversation was had because then we we kind of understood a little bit more where she was coming from. And then she understood that she needed to like work a little bit better about like in in that way so that, you know, I, I think it's also different when you invite people to like hang out with friends that, that are not friends with them. And so then you find yourself making excuses for people's awkwardness or rudeness because you don't want anybody to come off weird. But mm-hmm. yeah. sometimes you have to point it out. To fix the issue. I agree with you. And I th- I think it's good that y'all pointed it out to your friend. And it's really sweet, honestly, that you took the time to listen to what was kind of behind that. I think, you know, sometimes if you encounter somebody who's being kind of dickish in a conversation, it can be really easy to write that person off as being a dick and not really somebody you want to talk to. But like y'all have both alluded to, a lot of times there can be anxiety behind it. Um, and then my last one, this is like huge pet peeve of mine, happens in group settings. I think we've all been there. Um, so let me let me paint you a picture. Um, you're out to dinner in a situation with, you know, I would say five to eight friends. And there are a few members of the group who insist on doing silly things like writing the last four of their personal card (laughs) numbers next to individual line items on the receipt and then giving the server eight fucking cards to run. Um, Or sometimes you'll get the people who want to get uber uber granular about things, saying things like, oh, well, I just had water and you had like a soft drink or God forbid Mm -hmm. a glass of wine. I think that when you go out to eat with friends, the courteous and expedient thing to do to not make everybody's life hell is just to split the bill evenly. It irritates me so much when I'm out, particularly in large group settings, where somebody decides that they need to get their bill down to the exact scent of what they ordered. You didn't go out to eat for that purpose. You went out to eat with your friends because you wanted an experience dining with your friends. If you didn't want to spend money doing that, you could have had a dinner party at home or you could have just gotten together and not had dinner at all. You did this because you're looking for a specific experience pay for that experience and don't make everyone else's life hell while you sit grappling over, you know, $8 or whatever for 30 minutes. Yeah. (laughs) While everyone tries to get it together. Can you tell I've been in this situation before? (laughs) It really fucking pisses me off. My whole thing (laughs) is too, is that's also the person who every time without fail says, well, my dish was only $16.50, but they did not factor in tip or tax. Right. So then it's like, what are you doing? Because you're still shortchanging the table. 
I've also been in situations where we all write the last four of the card numbers at the top and also put next to it the total. So not next to each line item, like Laura was describing. That is extreme. But even so, everybody doing the math on how much they owe is such a frustrating experience. I agree about splitting it evenly as long as everybody spends similar-ish amounts. I you know, agree. I'm not sweating over a few dollars, especially if it's if it is a big party and you are splitting it evenly, it's going to be a difference of what? A couple dollars that you have to pay more? Yeah. Now, if the person is getting like way more expensive drinks, then I would probably object. But if we're all if the drinks are within a difference of, you know, four bucks of each other and we're getting a similar number of rounds too, then okay. My my suggestion for people is to just be the person it, that is self-aware enough to know that if your entree was way more expensive or you ordered a few more drinks, say, oh, um, yeah, let's split it down the middle, but let me put more tip down because I yeah, did X, Y, Z. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. exactly. Or like, let me grab the tip. That's It's an easy way to come across so well with every single person that you'll come across in your life. And of course, the waiter and restaurant hates this too. Sometimes they limit how many cards you can use for a single bill. Yeah. Though, I mean, the other the alternative is you can tell them upfront separate checks. They seem to be yeah. okay with doing that. I don't yes. think that's an extra burden on them. No. Because they offer it a lot of the time. They won't do it in obviously bigger parties like six or more because they, they, you know, have a guaranteed tip to that. I think that that's kind mm. of a dickish move too mm-hmm. if you do that. Mm. But yes, for in most cases, if you're if it's just two people or, you know, maybe three or four, they'll probably do it or or they'll at least do it, um, split it in half. You know, they'll say, oh, we can do like two checks. D- yeah, and then at least the it's, it's way easier for you to like square away with one other person than, than it is to square away with four. Right. Definitely. I agree. Definitely have done that before. Like when we've gone out with another couple, for example, Makes complete sense. And I agree with the point about if somebody really has a very, a a big difference in what they ordered, then yeah, you should be self-aware enough to say, let me, you know what, let me just grab the check and y'all can Venmo me, you know, whatever your part was. Um, Or like, let me just, let's split this and... I will, like Pam said, take care of the tip or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, The example that I thought of was like, if you go out to a dinner with a group of six friends and everybody gets like hamburgers and fries, but you get the Kobe beef and lobster. (laughs) Yes, there there is absolutely a difference there. And not everyone should be expected to (laughs) to pay for your your, yeah your expensive ass food but if it's generally like within the same range i don't understand why people sweat it i can't tell you i mean like i don't i don't eat meat the number of times we go out to places with friends where appetizers are ordered that have meat in them all, all the time i don't care can you imagine if I was like, oh, but I didn't eat any of that appetizer, so I'm not paying for it. Like, <laughs> go fuck yourself. <laughs> yeah. Please. Yeah. All right, Pam, what do you got for us? So the first one I have here is if your friend is dating someone you seriously object to, you have one shot to sit your pal down and say so. And I would extend this also to family members, too, like siblings, because I think we've all been there. We've all had either a friend or sibling who's dating somebody that we just like really don't like. And I do agree with this because at a certain point, especially if, you know, they're already adults, you could give advice. But you can't keep harping on it because it's that person's life and you just run the risk of, um, you know, uh, causing a rift in your relationship with that person. And at the end of the day, it's not worth it because you kind of get the sense when somebody's going to stick around versus when they're not. So yeah. all you can do is kind of be there for that person. And I think you also need to try and do it early because the longer into yes. the relationship it gets, the harder it is to be like, hey, so that person you've been dating for the last year right i actually freaking hate that because and then it's like why even why didn't you say anything sooner? in the early stages of dating yeah because the red flags will pop up before it's official 
for yes. sure. But once it's official, can't really do anything about it. So you better speak up when they're still <laughs> casual. Speak now or each forever other. hold your peace. Right, exactly. Yeah. And be prepared for them not to take it well. That's a distinct possibility. But yeah, I agree with this. On the other hand, if they end up breaking up with this person down the road, but then you tell them at the end, after the breakup occurs, oh, you know what? I never liked them. They might say, oh, I wish you said something. <laughs> then you yeah. just no have to bite your it was. tongue and knowing that you did, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I actually don't feel like that's really worth it usually, but... um. It's, it's funny you mentioned that because that we had a situation like that in my family. My youngest sister was, uh, I, I guess she had been dating. Some, she's dating somebody different now, but her last boyfriend before this happened to live in Portland. And so once when she was going to visit this ex-boyfriend, she had some time to kill. So my brother picked her up, Sergio picked her up, and then he dropped her off at the ex's house. And the next time we saw her, when we were all home together, he was like, so how's the guy? And she's like, oh, we broke up. I liked it last. He's like, yeah, I never liked him. And she's like, why did you say anything? And he's yeah. like, well, because you're 23 and, you know, I can only say so much. He's like, I didn't like him. She's like, you only met him once. He's like, once was enough. <laughs> she was <laughs> yeah, like, well, you, you don't want to hurt them. Six- you don't want to insult them. Yeah. And it's like, oh, maybe they know more about this person than I do. So who right. am I to judge? All that. He's like, no, nah, I got a bad vibe. And she's like, you saw him for five minutes. She's like, I just knew. And she's like, well, you were right. But I wouldn't have listened. So. <laughs> Uh, so my next one is, if you've met someone and they clearly don't remember your name, say, hi, we've met, I'm X. And I would add to this, too, that, like, if you're somebody's plus one, the polite thing to do to get your friend or your significant other out of a jam is to introduce yourself to the person you don't know so that they have to tell you their name. Oh. You can help out your friend or your date. That's a good tip. Pam, you're so savvy. <laughs> <laughs> Our social queen. I don't know if I have the guts to do this, though. Hi, we've already met. I'm Andrew. No, no. But usually what I will do is all because, you know, like, well, I don't know if you have to do this very much anymore, Andrew, but obviously, like, you meet a lot of people when you're working in media. And so you're going to forget somebody's name at some point. So usually to put other people out of their misery, because I've been on the other end where people are demanding that I tell them exactly what their name is and like where we met the first time and what have you, is I'll just say like, oh, hey, I don't know if you remember me. I'm Pamela. We met at this place. Yeah, that's It's nice that's to good. see you again. And then they go, oh, that's right. You, yeah. You, like, or usually in, they have something else. I'll throw in some additional context. Uh, Andrew, Andrew from Hypable. Oh, right. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, you look really familiar. I think we met at this place. <laughs> right, yeah. And then my last one is, if you're somebody's house guest, always strip the bed, even if they tell you not to worry about it. So yes, I, <laughs> you agree? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So I, I actually put this in here because I, this was something that I was taught to do. So I was raised to do this. Um, and so I think that that's why I do it. So it, I, I will also like, if I'm staying over at a friend's place, in addition to stripping the the bed or whatever, I'll fold the blankets and stack the pillows. So it it's a little less work for them, you know, regardless of if they're going to wash those things or not. But I won't judge people for not doing that because I don't know how other people will were raised. But I do notice when other people do it. And I think that it's very it's a very nice gesture. So it is. I know somebody who does this in hotels because, of course, they're going to take the sheets off to clean the room. I don't do it in hotels. (laughs) No, <laughs> Laura's like no, scoffing. No, no. Well, this this is house guests, not like hotel guests, you know. So it's like if I was staying over at either of your places, I would obviously a friendly courtesy. Yeah, yeah. I would strip but it's the, still but, the and same I would, thing. Like you're I saving time. I would probably for... even ask you both, like, oh, do you want me to take these to the laundry, or can you point me to the laundry and I'll just drop these off for you? Yeah, maybe I should do this. It's nice. I will say I'm not as nice as you, Pam. I do strip everything, and I will kind of fold it um, non-conventionally, like kind of like take the sheet and kind of like do a messy fold with it. And oh, yeah, like, yeah. And like lay it at the foot of the bed. Um, And I do not stack pillows. I'll put the pillows where they should be at the head of the bed. But um, that's what I do. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do I not will fold say, anything. I, I don't fold the dirty sheets because I know those are going to get washed. But like I'll fold the blanket, you know. Okay. I yeah. don't. 
<laughs> okay. Well, that's okay. <laughs> I, I think it's an excess. But like I said, you know, that was like something that my grandparents and also my mom was always like, if you go, like when we stay over here, remember, you have to like strip the sheets and fold the stuff. And so. Well, thank you to The Cut for these and 131 more etiquette rules. You can find the full list online, of course. Kind of fun to browse through. We were, we've been talking about this for a while. I think uh, this is like a fun, dare I say, social activity. Go through the rules with your friends and debate them. I don't yeah. know. People are like, wow, I don't want to hang out with Andrew. Now I know why that one guy wouldn't shut up. He <laughs> didn't want to give Andrew a chance. Hey. <laughs> Let's talk etiquette rules. <laughs> If you don't want to find yourself at an uncomfortable dinner out situation with a friend who is insisting on uh, splitting the bill eight ways, do this instead. Just get together, order a pizza, <laughs> and there do this go. in the living room. Yeah. More show today, but first, this week's sponsor brightens and shakes up my evenings, HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. If you're looking for an easy way to eat well and save money, cut back on expensive takeout and delivery with HelloFresh. You'll love how fast, easy, and affordable it is to whip up a restaurant-quality meal right in your own kitchen. No matter your lifestyle or meal preferences, HelloFresh has recipes sure to please everyone at your table. From fit and wholesome to veggie or family friendly, you'll always find something even the pickiest eaters will enjoy. Picky people will also love the flexibility. You can pick your meals and skip delivery weeks if you need to. Not only are the meals delicious and unique, but they also come nicely organized, so they're easy to store in your fridge. I think Pat and I have been returning to certain HelloFresh recipes for close to a year now because we fall in love with some of these recipes and we want to enjoy them again and again. We like doing the fit and wholesome themed meals because we eat terribly on the weekends. So to make up for it, HelloFresh comes through with with healthy meals during the week while still enjoying something very, very satisfying. You got to give them a try. Once you start making these, you'll be so glad you did. And we've got discount codes so you can get this great stuff for less. Go to HelloFresh.com slash M-I-L-L-6-5 and use code M-I-L-L-6-5 for 65% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash M-I-L-L-6-5 and use code M-I-L-L-6-5 for 65% off plus free shipping. We'll have links in the show notes as well. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. All right. Uh, before we hop into this next one or float off to this next one, I guess I could say, Andrew, do you want to explain the title that you gave this segment? Oh, when show? we were doing our planning meeting last Friday <laughs> and sharing it with our executive producer patrons, I just thought of it. Even though I haven't seen the movie or read the book, and I just typed in, you'll float too. So the title of this segment is You'll Float Too. And what is it about? Chinese surveillance balloons. <laughs> <laughs> so you're probably already familiar with this story, but as kind of a quick rundown for anyone who may have missed it. Um, in late January, a Chinese surveillance balloon entered U.S. airspace near Alaska. It ended up traveling over Canada and the continental U.S., um, it spent quite a bit of time over Montana for some reason. It was later shot down um, a few days later off the coast of South Carolina after it. And this is according to the U.S. military. This is an actual quote. After it stopped loitering over Montana and proceeded as fast as it could. <laughs> toward well, I got to get out coast. of here. <laughs> Since then, though. Adding even more to the story, three other unidentified objects have been shot down over Alaska and Canada, which prompted, you know, some rumors and some interpretations that there were multiple of these spy balloons um, that didn't end up being the case, at least not in this circumstance. Um, but I thought we could share some details about the balloon, the confirmed one that was shot down off the coast of South Carolina. The one and only. This thing was 200 feet tall with a, quote, jetliner-sized payload. 
So this thing was huge. It was taller than the Statue of Liberty. It also contained tech equipment that could pick up communication signals and other sensitive information. It had solar panels on it, multiple antennas, and multiple propellers, and weighed more than a couple thousand pounds. (laughs) Pretty big beast. Yeah, huge. Um, Did you guys see the pictures of this thing being recovered out of the Atlantic? (laughs) I did, and the video of it being shot. Yeah. I mean, when you saw it up in the sky, it was so, so high up. What was it, 40,000 feet or maybe even higher because it was above commercial airline uh, altitudes. It looks small, of course, but like, I don't know, just threw off my perspective of it. And I never could have imagined it was the size of two or three buses. Well, also, when you hear the word balloon, you're thinking a completely different thing. Balloon, you're thinking, uh, right? Yeah. Something small and wholesome. Yeah. A little happy birthday balloon. This was not that. Um, Maybe we can use a picture of this for our social posts or something this week. Um, It was definitely not small and cute. And I think what you're both alluding to and what a lot of people were wondering last week was, why wasn't this balloon shot down sooner? It was allowed to traverse basically the entire North American continent um, from Alaska all the way down to South Carolina. And I think when you think of it as a balloon, it sounds easy, logical, kind of obvious that you would shoot something like that down if you thought that it was spying on you. Um, But the military actually said that it waited until the balloon was no longer over U.S. territory in order to remove the possibility that falling debris could harm people. We have to remember this thing was huge. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that Pennywise the clown (laughs) carries around. Um, It really could have hurt people if it had been shot down over any population centers, right? Right. It was initially spotted over Montana, though, and there's a lot of open space out there. So I wonder if they did the math and determined that if they shot it down, it would hit some populated area, no matter how small. But I've also been thinking that maybe they didn't want to shoot it down because of that. Yes. But also, I think Americans just generally would hate the idea of knowing the military is shooting down an object And it's going to land on land. It's not so much that it could potentially hit somebody. It's also that it's being shot down over our country. It's just an uncomfortable feeling to know that something could fall out of the sky at any moment. Yeah. And I think to consider, too, you know, you're right. There is a lot of wide open area in Montana, but... I think there are a lot of farming communities out there. There are protected lands out there. And with something like this that's flying, you know, this thing does have navigation control when it's in flight. But when you shoot it down, you can't predict where it's going to land. And even if it doesn't hurt anybody, it could still cause, you know, destructive property damage or damage to, you know, things that are not recoverable or fixable. So I understand why they waited. Yeah, that's a good point. I also think that there was an, a secondary benefit, and this is just me. This is just me thinking about this too much. There's a secondary benefit to allowing this thing to sort of um, go its course and eventually take it out over the ocean. You know, one, it's safer for people, but it gave the U.S. military a few days to potentially spy on the spy balloon and learn more about Chinese intelligence gathering practices or potentially even get information from the balloon itself. I mean, the balloon um, carcass, if you will, has been recovered. And RIP. Yeah, is is going to be investigated at Quantico by the FBI. So there's definitely some of that happening, but you never know what the military or our intelligence would have been able to pick up um, through like various communication signals while that thing was in the air. We should absolutely study this thing. And yet 
This is such a rudimentary device coming from one of the biggest espionage countries in the world. Right. It's like, why would you do that? Of course, we were going to catch that. Well, uh, what were you going to say, Pam? No, I was just like silently agreeing. But I also think that sometimes something that is unobtrusive is maybe the best way to go. It's kind of like the Trojan horse situation right yeah it doesn't look like much on the outside but on the inside there's a lot going oh, on oh i see so. we shouldn't be worried about it because it's so like 1940s right exactly or they know exactly what it looks like and that it seems so bulky and bumbling of a thing for them to do that they think it's good distraction fodder for whatever actual intel gathering is being done not to say that this thing wasn't gathering intel but it it kind of does feel like maybe it was intended to be a distraction Mm. but don't worry y'all because it wasn't i guess we should issue this question now it wasn't a spy balloon um china actually released a statement on this saying that this was a weather balloon that veered off course I know Americans are stupid, but you have to understand, China, we're not that stupid. Oh, sure. We've all been there. We throw up our drone, our civilian weather balloon, and just accidentally flies across the Pacific Ocean. What? Really? Along with this news, in the days following the balloon and its destruction in the Atlantic Ocean, um, there were other unidentified objects Uh, over North America. There were three of them that happened over the course of the week following this. And for a while, nobody really knew what to expect. We kept getting notifications about another unidentified flying object being shot down either over Canada or off the coast of Alaska. And it, you know, caused people to jump to the assumption that maybe these were more spy balloons. Um, The NSC actually says that the U.S. has not detected that any of the objects were sending communications like the famous spy balloon um, and that they didn't show any signs of self-propulsion or maneuvering like the spy balloon did. Um, The NSC also says that these objects were shot down more quickly because they were smaller than the Chinese balloon. Um, And they said that there may even be benign and totally explainable reasons for why these objects were flying above North America, anywhere between 20,000 and 40,000 feet in the air, which feels a little suspect to me. I don't know. I don't know if there's a benign reason for that. Apparently, one of the objects was the size of a small car. It's pretty big. I need to know why that was flying. <laughs> yeah, I. it's such an interesting situation because it's also like, well, we found out that three balloons flew over America when Trump was president, but they didn't know they flew over until after they crossed the country. Of course, Trump's denying that that ever happened. But then the media is now suddenly paying a lot of attention to any object flying over the country. America feels the need to share with the country that they are shooting these things down. They don't have to share this information. They could keep it quiet. Are they afraid politically this looks bad if these things fly across and then it's reported later? So the Biden administration wants to get out ahead of this. Like It's a very strange situation, all of this. And of course, the media now has a boner for reporting on UFOs, especially ones that are shot down, because people are going to tune in for live coverage of that and want to read more about that. So the whole situation has really spiraled. There's a lot of questions here that remain to be answered. The motives, everybody's motives. Yeah, I'm with you there, because on one hand, to Laura's point, it's not that balloons have never flown over north america but on the other hand the emphasis on taking the big one out and just the continued coverage and it it just and again because we've never really seen as much emphasis put on balloon coverage before it feels like they're popping up more and more regularly now and i i just have like no barometer for how common it is. And I think that a lot of people are in that same boat. So then we don't know if we're supposed to be worried or not. Yeah. No, it's a good point um, because it does kind of to the earlier point that y'all brought up, 
it feels so old school that it does make you wonder how long have these been floating around? How long has China been using this as a spy technique? Um, To the point about China having a history doing this, Andrew, you mentioned, you know, three of them are believed to have crossed the country while Trump was in office. There was one um, that happened earlier on in Biden's administration. Um, And also just last week, while all of this balloon talk was going on, um, another Chinese uh, surveillance balloon crossed over parts of Central and South America. Um, And China once again, um, had a very innocuous reason for that. They said it was being used for flight tests. Mm, Just testing flying in across the world. Right. And why would we do that? (laughs) No reason. (laughs) Exactly. But what is funny about this is, you know, all of this unidentified flying object talk, everybody's obsession with aliens, to Andrew's point, actually prompted White House Press Secretary Jean Pierre um, to give kind of a tongue in cheek briefing in which she said there's no indication of extraterrestrial activity <laughs> around these objects. Yes. Andrew, I, I pulled a clip and it's it's pretty short. I don't know if you want to play it. Oh, OK. Um, well, but before that, over the weekend, somebody at the White House said in the briefing room, I think we haven't ruled out anything yet, including aliens. So that got people talking too. Right. It's just fun to think they they won't even say no to aliens at at that current juncture. Here's the clip. There have been questions and, and concerns about this, but there is no, again, no indication of aliens or extraterrestrial activity with these recent takedowns. Again, there is no indication of aliens or terrestrial activity with these recent takedowns. Wanted to make sure that the American people knew that, all of you knew that, uh, and it was important for us to say that from here because we've been hearing a lot about it. Yeah, well, they you said you hadn't ruled it out. So that's why you were hearing about it. I mean, <laughs> that per- there was somebody in the audience like laughing in the in the press room. I it's not the craziest question. <laughs> like No, it's really not. My concern is not so much the surveilling because we're surveilling other countries all the time, and of course China's surveilling us all the time, but the concern to me now is this position that we're now in with China because China's not happy with how we handled this first balloon. We're obviously not happy with China doing this. Secretary of State Blinken was supposed to visit Beijing. Right. That was on the books before this happened. Then this happens. He cancels his trip. Now there's talk of potentially entering a new Cold War. Where's China going to go from here? It's like that. That's the part that worries me how China reacts to our shooting it down and us pointing the finger at them. Seems kind of rich for China to be upset that we shot down a balloon in our own aerial territory. I know, it's so though. stupid. I, I agree. You know? I agree, but that's that's the position they're taking. Of course they are. But borders extend out into the sea and out into the air to a certain extent. But then there's like free no man's land, right? And if they didn't want their balloon shot down, then maybe they should have kept it further off the coast. I mean, I don't know what to to tell China there. It just seems kind of um, seems kind of silly for them to be taking that stance. But what can you do? Yeah, I mean, I think part of that may be motivated by the fact that in a lot of ways, the U.S. has not put its best foot forward on the world stage in recent history, and that has created somewhat of a power vacuum for China to gain more influence in that regard. Um, So the further that we step back, and the more isolationist we become, we kind of invite this sort of thing on ourselves, especially when somebody's competing to be a world power. Yeah, Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. a good point. So we thought that we could end this on somewhat of a light note uh, by making some predictions. Um, Where do we think the next balloon is going to appear? I'm thinking of launching one of my own and seeing how far (laughs) it can go, since that's kind of trendy right now. (laughs) Let me see. I will predict one will show up above the skies of Texas within the next month. And of course, Texas is going to lose their shit. 
if they spot a balloon. That thing's going down. No matter how many people get killed on the ground, that thing is going down. <laughs> You know that there are people in Texas that have been waiting. <laughs> oh, <ready>. yeah. <laughs> people have been saying that, too, online. Like, I would shoot that out of the sky if I saw that on the ground. Um, It's super like, high. What, you would what, miss. What rifle? You would, right, know, right. you would miss. And by the way, I have to remind everybody again, I had that end of year prediction in our season eight finale. I said, quote, there will be a UFO sighting the likes of which we've never seen. And I may have meant aliens at the time, but this prediction has come true. This is a story. It was unique in that this one was spotted while it was flying across the country. And you could see it from the ground. You couldn't shoot it from the ground, Texans, but you could see it from the ground. I think Texas is a good prediction. Um, I will say probably somewhere off the West Coast because they've already kind of come east. So maybe kind of closer to like the U.S.-Mexico border. Okay. You're feeling Southern as well. Somewhere around there. Yeah. Interesting. I was thinking... How close can they get to some of the more central government and financial establishments that exist on the East Coast? I'm wondering how close they can get to something like that without being detected. It's probably why they either haven't gone there or they're doing something more subtle in those areas because... (laughs) You you couldn't fly one of these things over D.C., for example. Oh, or, yeah. Or New York. Well, nothing can fly over those cities, right? Technically, no. Like at a, yeah. So that makes sense. So I wonder where they'd need to be. If I had to if I had to bet on what was next, I think I would say that. However close Maybe they could fly get. over Mar-a-Lago. You oh, know, that'd be great. Oh, my house. God. <laughs> I'll fly my drone over Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> I don't care if it gets shot down. That'd still be fun. Well, see, here's the thing. They don't have to surveil Trump. He'll just tell them. <laughs> He'll just hand That's over true. classified He'll get on documents. Twitter and share the information. True. Um, and final prediction. How many balloons do we think there are going to be in 2023? I think we should add this to our year in review. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, we can keep track. I'm hoping this starts to slow down. Like I said, I think now there's a lot of media interest in highlighting any balloons that are shot down. The government wants to share that they're shooting this stuff down for whatever reason. Again, they don't have to do that. I'm just going to say, I'm going to be conservative and and say 10 because I don't want this to be an ongoing story throughout the year. Unless it's a serious one, like another one of the original balloon from China And I just envision the Halloween costumes. I I can't wait for that. I'm hoping it's going to be small. Let's move on from this. Ten. I'll say at least three more. So a little bit more conservative than you. (laughs) I was going to say what we've had a total of five so far. Four in North America. One in in, uh, Latin America that we know of. Or no, excuse me, not four. There are only two. Two total, right? Two real ones. Two real ones. I'll say four more. I'm not going to steal Pam's answer. Okay. I can share. <laughs> and I, the reason I think that is because there was probably a fleet of these that were sent out around the same time. So there may be a few more floating around out there that just haven't been discovered yet. Picturing China sending them all off at once and just like waving <laughs> goodbye as they all fly off into the sunset. <laughs> all right. Well, enough of all this scary news, Pam. I mean, my news is a little bit scary, too, but in a different way. So a couple of weeks ago now, there was some information on Netflix's password sharing crackdown that got leaked, and they've since walked it back. And we've talked about this before. We are not surprised by the fact that they're going to start cracking down on password sharing. This is something that they shared in a first quarter meeting. And they've also been testing this out in Latin American countries, but it looks like a lot of us that are not in those countries are going to start seeing the brunt of what this entails very soon. So as it stands right now, they've already extended their rollout to the crackdown um, and expanded it to include Canada, New Zealand, Portugal, and Spain. So, Under the new rules there, which will likely be what we'll see out here in North America, too. So that's why we wanted to keep you all updated on this, is that um, 
Netflix is going to start prompting and helping users set up a primary location for their Netflix account. And that will allow anyone who lives in the same household to easily access one Netflix account. But that also means that anybody who's on your plan that lives outside of your household in a different part of the country, or maybe you're sharing with a friend that lives a couple cities away they're going to be SOL because Netflix will now detect that they don't share your IP address or your general location. And so when that happens, anyone detected outside of the household will be encouraged to create a new account. And they will be combating this also by asking you to verify your location. And they're going to send like a, you know, four digit code to the primary account holder, which you know, might be fine. But if you're binging late at night, you might not be able to get a hold of that person to evade this for long. Uh, But their plan here is basically is that if you're detected outside the primary household, that they'll encourage you to sign up for a new account by enticing you with the fact that you'll be able to transfer all of your profile settings and your my list and your watch views over to this brand new shiny account that they're hoping you'll sign up for and give them more money for. If anybody wants to keep people outside of their household on their account, they will still be able to do that as long as they're signed up for a standard or premium subscription plan. Uh, But they will have to pay an extra monthly fee. And this will cover up to two people that they don't live with. So in Canada right now, that is looking like $7.99 additionally per month. Um, And then in New Zealand, it's uh, $7.99 as well. In Europe, it's $3.99. And in Portugal, it's $5.99. All local currencies. Wow. Yes, all local currencies. So ultimately, it's going to be cheaper to just add somebody on to your plan than kicking them off. So I think a lot of people are just going to go for paying a little more per month and then just splitting that via Venmo every month or whatever. Yeah, I think so. It's kind of a clever way to raise prices again. Yeah. Without actually forcing people onto a more expensive plan because you're giving the illusion of choice, right? Right, exactly. And obviously, you know, again, confining this option to standard or premium guarantees you that somebody is shelling out more already. But these base prices for like the the ad supported that they're going to start rolling out and then like the basic plan are almost not worth it. If only for the resolution alone, it's only like 720p. Or something like that with when most people are watching probably in their living rooms, even on um, laptops, 720 is really shitty quality. Yeah. So yeah. they're kind of forcing you. In, it's like, what's the point of having these? They're basically forcing you into buying at least into a standard plan. So, yeah. And there's still a lot of questions. Of, I mean, they should give some leeway here. An example I brought up a few months ago was what about if. Your kid goes off to college. You have to start paying extra because he's watching it from college. There's a lot of edge cases there that I'm curious to know if they're going to try to uh, offer some leeway to because it really just doesn't seem fair. But this also might just be the new normal. Yeah. Yeah. Traveling too is I, I was reading over there their new statement because, you know, they walked back the leaked information that they've been kind of using to try this out in Latin America. But uh, originally, they said that if you were traveling outside your home network, you'd have to ask them for basically a hall pass so that you could access. Do you guys remember? Yes. Yes. It's like once a month, that device had to check into Netflix from home. Yes. Before it could go out to play. And so while they're saying that you will still be able to sign in, if you're on vacation or you're traveling for work outside of your home network, there aren't too many details as to how they're going to make a solution for that that is relatively seamless because it does kind of seem a little bit hectic and chaotic to ask people to ask Netflix for, you know, an extra code that they can then use to sign in at a hotel, for example. That is such bullshit. Bullshit. And bullshit. It's both. I have YouTube TV. This is the streaming television service. So I can watch live CBS, ABC, CNN, etc. I stream it through Apple TV. YouTube TV is great. You get an unlimited DVR so you can record anything you want. You don't have to worry about running out of space. It works really well too. When I travel, when I bring my laptop to a hotel, 
and I load up YouTube TV, it says, oh, are you traveling right now? And I say, yes, I am. And it says, okay, we won't bother you about this location for a week. I think that's the way to do it. Don't yep. send a code, a verification code. Say, oh, you're here temporarily. Okay, enjoy. We'll get back to you in a week. And that's worked out really well. So just do something like that. That's the, the honor system. Yeah, it's like, yeah. And it, and it still knows where your home location is. And I get why YouTube TV needs to be stingy about that. I mean, they're all tied up in archaic television rules and regulations and rights and blah, blah, blah. Netflix, they can, you know, obviously this isn't actually an issue. They don't need to limit um, where people are watching from and how many different homes are using the same account. They are just out of new customers to sell Netflix to. So now they need to stop people from sharing a password. And that's definitely what this comes down to, in addition to the fact that they took a huge hit last year when they announced how many subscribers they had lost. And obviously, Netflix is in a position right now where they don't want to really hear about why people are starting to cancel your subscription. Spoiler alerts, it's because they're canceling good content and people are sick of it. We're done. But yeah, but, you know, I don't think that this is going to see the return that they're looking for, although I guess they are kind of getting investors ready because I was reading over that first quarter or that that fourth quarter statement where they announced this and they said that they do anticipate taking a hit from rolling this out. So I guess at least they're slightly self-aware. Yeah, and it's just not a good look for their brands. I mean, this is the this is the Netflix that back in 2017 tweeted love is sharing a password. And now they're like, never mind old self because yeah. we're out of people to sell Netflix to. Didn't the CEO at that time say that um, he didn't care either that people were sharing passwords? Yeah. I guess it's easy not to care when your business is booming, but as soon yeah. as you start trending down, you're like, wait, actually, we do care. Wait, this has been really <laughs> dumb of us to do all this time. HBO always leaned into this too. Share your HBO password. They mm -hmm. haven't cracked down yet, but they will at some point. Yeah. Netflix is on the forefront of this. And before you know it, HBO is going to start charging extra for, for 4K like Netflix does. Disney Plus will. They'll crack down on password sharing. And they're all adding options for you to pay less in exchange for serving you advertising in the middle of shows. We're almost fully back to the days of traditional cable television in terms of costs, commercials, and the sort of garbage content on these platforms. It's just gone full circle. Well, AMC is also looking to fuck around and find out. Uh, they actually announced last week that they are doing a new tiered ticket pricing system, which I'm sure that many of you have also heard about as well. So this is a feature that's called Sightline, and the program basically splits seats in a theater into three different tiers, which are value, standard, and preferred. So value seats are labeled as the cheapest price. So you will save a little bit of money if you want to go with this option. But that also means that you might have to do so at the expense of your neck because these are going to be seats right in front of the movie theater, which like, let's be real, nobody wants to sit there <laughs> the anyway. Who the fuck would want and to you, deal with that? <laughs> you're only sitting there if the show sold out, you didn't plan ahead. Um, ADA seats are also included in value, which I think is really great. And hopefully this does not impact people that actually need those seats as a result of what they're trying to do here. Standard is the run of the mill standard ticket price. So that'll be the price that you're used to paying at your local AMC theater. These are described as the most common seats in the theater, but AMC did not give more description aside from that. And the third tier is preferred, which is going to cost you a couple more dollars. This is the most expensive option. And these are seats right in the middle of the auditorium. One thing to note is that, you know, AMC is not completely greedy because they're going to give a little bit of a break to anybody that signs up for their Stubbs A-list members subscription model. They will not have to pay extra for these seats, but they're already shelling out about $20 extra a month to be part right. Of it's a monthly program, subscription. So. They're still being greedy. Exactly. <laughs> good, good perk for A-list, <laughs> I admit, but they're still charging people monthly whether or not they go to the movies any given month. Do y'all have yeah. a preferred row that you book seats in when you go to the movies? How will you be impacted by this? It probably, for me, it would be in the preferred area. I also don't mind sitting all the way in the back. 
I'll sit up high and in the back. That way I can make out nobody's watching me from behind me. (laughs) So here's the other thing to uh, pay attention to with regards to this new change is that it's only going to impact showtimes after 4 p.m. And as is well documented on this show, I like to go with the other grandparents, early bird smart. (laughs) So So it's not going to impact me at all. And also, I, I will be transparent and mention that I don't have an AMC near me. So as long as Regal doesn't do this, then I'm fine because Regal is my local theater. Mine as Same. well. So, oh, OK. So we're all unaffected by this. But Regal and AMC did both do the varying ticket prices for new movies. We'll get to that in a few minutes. So this could be coming to Regal. They also couldn't enforce this. So I can see why they're limiting this to movies after 4 p.m. Because let's say Pam goes to her 9 a.m. showing of the third Downton Abbey movie. And she and several elderly people are there. But like 95% of the theater is empty. Pam could buy the front row seat to save a couple bucks. Then just move herself up to the prime preferred seating because nobody's sitting in it. People would get away with that all the time if they enforced this around the clock. I will say, too, that I mean... Because of COVID, most theaters have moved into this assigned seating function, which I think is great. But I have definitely showed up to a movie and somebody's sitting in my seat. And it's always so awkward when you have to tell them, hey, that's my seat. You know, I need you to move, you know? Yeah, it is. I've done I've screwed up a couple of times. I like get confused by that, the numbering. That's in good faith. Though. Yeah. yeah, it is because you know me, but they think I'm trying to take their seat and they're like, <laughs> oh, that asshole I'm trying to take my seat. I'm sorry. I was also wanting to point out that one of the things that the AMC CEO stressed in their statement announcing this new program is that the goal was to start getting moviegoers thinking about buying movie tickets the same way that they might contemplate which tickets to buy for other events like concerts, plays, and sporting events. So I wanted to open that question to all of us here. Why is this mentality not going to work in a movie theater setting? There is a very clear difference to me. When you attend a concert, a play, a sporting event, you are paying for a live, physical, be in the room where it happens experience. A movie at AMC is a pre-taped film projected onto a wall. Yeah. And they have the nerve to make you pay more for that. When also, you will continue to have to deal with people checking their phones and talking during a movie. Two things that people do at live events, but it's less distracting than it is in a movie theater. I agree. When you go to a concert or a play, it's an experience. Going to the movies is not an experience. I mean, sometimes if you see a really good movie that moves you, great, but it's still not the same thing. This is such gaslighting. I know. To say, I know. It like, totally is. Well, to that point, Andrew, about this potentially becoming the new normal, do we think that this is something that's going to stick? Are we worried that our local regals are going to be rolling this out soon, too, as a result of AMC's decision? Or do we think that they're just going to like let AMC die on this hill? Well, I think they're going to watch to see the reception to this news from AMC, because like I mentioned a few minutes ago, AMC and Regal added, I don't know what to call it exactly, variable prices for movies, depending on what movie it is. And that seems to have stuck. I went looking on AMC's website and Regal's site today for this Friday at AMC, for example, my local AMC, Megan is eleven ninety nine, Friday night, and Ant Man is twelve ninety nine. Okay, dollar difference, not the biggest deal. Regal, meanwhile, our favorite movie chain, Ant Man this Friday, the new Ant Man sixteen fifty, but Jesus Revolution and Cocaine Bear that are coming out next Friday, those are thirteen fifty. So they're raising the price by $3. Exactly. And frankly, I think I'd rather see Cocaine Bear than (laughs) Ant-Man. I think I'd rather see Cocaine Bear. (laughs) I want to see both of those movies desperately. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Cocaine Bear looks freaking insane. It looks great. (laughs) But yeah, so they are. This has been going on for a good year now. I get it. Less people are going. But this is the other thing. Less people are going to the movies. So they're trying to make more money. 
this isn't going to help. You need to create a better experience. This is just going to piss people off. The movies are already so expensive as it is. Right. And most of the, I hate to say this because like I get it, it costs a lot of money to renovate, but most movie theaters are really run down. Yeah. Like they're, you know, everybody knows we're like the nice lush movie theater is in their mm-hmm. town. And most of the time it's not the Cineplex. Yep. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, it feels like such a similar move to what Netflix is doing with password sharing. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. It feels like kind of trying to redefine an experience that they helped build and now trying to tell us, oh, actually, that thing that you've been doing your entire life, that's not actually what it is. And because it's something different, because we say so, we want you to pay more for it. Yeah. Promise me, like, nobody will talk in the theater. You're going to patrol the theaters for anybody talking. Or I have, like, a little silent report button. I can, like, hit the button and then type in the seat. And then you, like, I don't know, spill popcorn from the ceiling onto their head. Just promise a better movie-going experience, and then I'm probably willing to pay more. When movie theaters started going to reserve seating and reclined seats, that was the best. Those are wonderful things everybody can get behind. But they haven't really advanced the movie-going experience. Like, if you look at AMC's site, like I was earlier today, they have all these different, like, AMC type of theaters. I do not need that. I'm a simple podcaster. I like the one section of my movie theater uh, where they have just a 2D screen and nice reclining seats. That's all I need. A good, clean screen, 2D, nice seats that recline. Just, I don't know. Add more simple amenities like that. And I'm down to pay a little more. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, with inflation, everything is getting more expensive. So I understand that they're trying to figure out ways to package that without just saying prices are going up. Yeah. But you should at least make people feel like they're getting something new or something different out of an increased experience like that. If you want to make them think that going to the movies is the same experience as going to a concert. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see how much worse this gets for movie goers. Coming up in After Dark today, in honor of Valentine's Day, we're going to take each other on a date. The wine will be flowing as we each pick a couple questions from the New York Times' The 36 Questions That Lead to Love, and we're going to pose them to one another. Get ready to open up, gang, over a bottle of wine that Laura and Mark intended for themselves after today's (laughs) recording. We'd love your support at patreon.com slash millennial. That's where we record bonus content every week and not just after dark, but we do a new variety show. We hang out with Bay and higher patrons once a month. You've got our exclusive Discord group. We've got these new planning meetings that we're releasing every other Friday. Lots more. Patreon.com slash millennial. Lots more is available. Thanks, everybody. And now it's time for some recommendations. This is going to be an off-the-wall recommendation, but I heard this on a podcast a few weeks ago, and I've been wanting to bring it up on the show. This is specifically for Americans. Do you know how much you will be receiving in Social Security when you retire? For many of us, it's probably you know a few decades off. But you can know already how much you will be receiving in Social Security, depending on what age you retire. You just go to ssa.gov to make a free account, and then it'll show you a chart. If you retire at 62, you'll be receiving this much. 65, this much. 70, that much. And it was kind of cool to see. And um, I recommend it because it's it's interesting for planning for your future. And of course, something to remember is that the amount we receive in Social Security will go up because of inflation. So the numbers you see aren't probably going to be the numbers you see in 30 years, but it'll be that at minimum, let's hope. So um, definitely check that out. That's cool. Chloe's going to hate you for <laughs> that one. She well, you um sometimes you have more abstract recommendations. Oh. And she I think she said it to you before, but she's like, oh my she god, did. find finding like a way to describe this succinctly or like finding art to use for this is such a bitch. I hope it's just a, a bald eagle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just do that. Like. Holding a wad of cash in its claw. 
There you go. <laughs> how about I take a screenshot of exactly how much I'll be making when I retire, and then she can post that. Yeah, you definitely want people to know that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is truth in journalism. And then everybody will feel superior to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, mine was okay. I was pretty I was pretty happy with it, actually. It made, it made me feel good about my future for once in my life. <laughs> I was like, that much money and I don't have to work? Cool. Well, I don't know how to transition away from that. Um, <laughs> my recommendation is... Um, it's it's just a, a cosmetic item. Rare Beauty's Illuminating Primer. Um, I really, really like their primer. If you're going to wear like any kind of foundation or anything, it's really good to wear a primer under it just to kind of smooth the surface to give you an even space to apply on um, to do your makeup. This stuff is really nice. Um, it does a really good job of blurring pores and it has this nice kind of sheen to it that you would think would show up all sparkly on your face, but somehow it doesn't. It just gives you a really nice glow. So if you haven't had a chance to check it out and you need a new primer, I would recommend checking out Rare Beauties. And I wanted to recommend Storygraph for tracking your reading slash setting reading goals. I've been using Goodreads for quite a while, but if you exist in any uh, book spaces online, you might have seen a lot of people talking about moving over to Storygraph. And one of the main reasons that people are starting to do this is because Storygraph does not have any affiliation with Amazon. That's not really the reason why I chose to try it out. It was mostly because I was really curious about some of the features that they offer that Goodreads does not. And I'm really pleased with it so far. So I highly recommend checking it out. Um, one of the things that I really like about it is that it allows you to set multiple goals. So it's not just I want to read this many books. You can also set uh, goals for how many pages you're hoping to read over the course of 2023. Or if you're an avid audiobook listener, you can also set a goal for how many hours you'd like to listen to throughout the year. So it's really customizable, which is really nice. Um, their stats are a little bit more in depth too, because it'll break things down uh, by charts uh, based on uh, the type of uh, genres and sub subgenres you tend to gravitate towards. And then I also really like their tagging system because it really kind of gives you a quick, easy to digest overview of any book you might be interested in. So I just finished rereading Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid, and I'm looking at the tags for this book. So they have basic ones like fiction, historical, literary, music, but then they also add extra ones like emotional, reflective, and medium paced. Um, the pacing one specifically is really helpful for me because sometimes you just want something that's going to really kind of get you in there and hook you. Definitely. So yeah, definitely recommend checking this out. They have a website and then also there is an app as well. So if you're more app based, they have that for you too. Cool. I will that's definitely really check cool. this out. Yeah. yeah. If you have any feedback about today's episode, you can send an email to millennialshow at gmail.com or use the contact form or anonymous confessional on millennialshow.com. You can also follow us on social media. We are Millennial Show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And over on TikTok, we are Millennial Pod. And don't forget, we would appreciate a review, especially if you're enjoying the show over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you love the show, five-star review. We appreciate any honest review. It does mean a lot. That does it for this week's episode. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. And I'm Pamela. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.